I thought uh, part of the purpose of this is to sort of maybe acquaint people with uh, um, research of faculty in general. So I'll, I'll say a couple of words about things I work on in general before I um, get into this topic. Um, uh, I'm really uh, an applied mathematician and about half my time I spend thinking about um, stochastic control problems. These are problems where you have to make um, decisions over time and there's uncertainty about what's going to happen. And they're really, you know, a class of abstract mathematical problems that are very challenging and fundamental in the sense that uh, many, um, you know, problems in engineering or in business and so on have that type of flavor. So that's um, uh, about what I do with half my time. Um, uh, prior to actually becoming an academic, um, uh, I did a number of, uh, of things in the working world. And one of those was uh, um, I managed a hedge fund for, uh, for, for a number of years. And motivated a, a little bit by that, the other half of my research is really the more applied side. And I think about um, uh, stochastic control problems in the context of financial engineering. And specifically, the kind of problems I'm interested in are problems uh, surrounding um, uh, optimal trading, um, uh, market microstructure, high frequency trading, and so on and so forth. So that's what I'm going to um, talk about uh, today. So um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is give you a little bit of flavor of the issues in um, uh, um, the you know, modern um, uh, electronic markets. And in order to sort of give you some appreciation for that, um, uh, you know, I think it's worth maybe going through what are some of the main features of, uh, of U.S. equity markets today, because really they're quite different than they were um, five and certainly ten um, years ago. So, so what are some of those features? Um, uh, first, markets are, are predominantly electronic, right? So you see this backdrop on CNBC where there's the New York Stock Exchange and people are yelling at each other and so on and so forth. To a large extent, that is irrelevant. Right? Um, that is not where the, um, the, the, the trading happens. The trading happens uh, um, uh, on, on computers. And uh, um, electronic trading has really, um, uh, certainly in equities, dominates um, uh, as the, uh, the primary mechanism of, uh, of exchange. Um, the second, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, we like to think of um, uh, um, something like an exchange as a mechanism for centralizing trade, of bringing buyers and sellers together so that uh, um, you know, there aren't search frictions and so on and so forth. Well, you know, really in the past five years, what's happened in the U.S. is that the opposite trend has occurred, is that trading has become decentralized or fragmented. In particular, for, um, uh, for, 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 for various reasons, there's no longer, um, uh, let's say, one primary exchange. It used to be that for any particular stock, you know, it was predominantly traded either on NASDAQ or, or NYSE. But now there's you know, um, a handful of them, and they're all important in the sense that each of those uh, you know, exchanges you know, accounts for at least maybe 5% of uh, um, uh, equity trading. So there's many venues. Trade is no longer um, uh, centralized. Um, uh, most of the venues are organized um, uh, um, uh, as exchanges. Um, they account for about 70% um, uh, of trade. And these exchanges are operated um, uh, typically as electronic limit order books in the sense of uh, um, uh, it's an uh, open market. Um, people can um, submit orders to buy and sell, and they attach prices. And uh, when um, the you know, um, uh, prices cross, there's trade and so on. Um, this is as opposed to a dealer market or a specialist market which is uh, the way historically the New York Stock Exchange was organized. However, um, uh, that um, would, would life would be too easy if we had just um, uh, one kind of market structure. So about 30% of trade occurs on um, uh, alternative kinds of venues, right? So here we have things like electronic crossing networks, dark pools, internalization, um, uh, so on and so forth. And um, finally, um, maybe from, from my perspective, the most um, striking feature is that the participants are increasingly automated. It used to be that if you were at, um, say, a uh, hedge fund and um, uh, you had a portfolio manager and he wanted to buy a million dollars worth of Google, there's some guy who's a trader and he knows how sort of these things works and he you know, makes calls and does stuff and you know, it happens over time, right? Well, now computers do that, right? So um, on the buy side, um, uh, investors under the rubric of uh, algorithmic trading, either themselves or on an agency basis as a service provided by brokers, they'll take large parent or orders and slice them, dice them over time and across exchanges and so on and so forth and uh, um, uh, trade them. Similarly, the guys who are providing liquidity, the market makers, again, these used to be sort of human traders. Now, um, uh, in um, uh, uh, most of these markets, um, uh, oftentimes they go under the rubric of high-frequency trading. One dominant kind of high-frequency trading is essentially um, uh, providing uh, um, uh, liquidity, um, providing market-making services. So um, uh, overall, um, the, you know, these are um, all quite recent trends. This last one is particularly great from, uh, from, from my perspective because as someone who likes to solve quantitative uh, decision-making problems, that means there's uh, stuff for me to, uh, um, to do here. But um, you know, the overall effect of this is that the, the, the world is much more complicated than it was before, right? And the interactions between you know, an algorithmic trader and a high-frequency trader and so on um, are, are, are difficult to predict. And in fact, you get things like this. 
right? So this um, uh, um, picture probably you've seen. This is the famous flash crash of May 6, 2010. And um, you know, the uh, SEC did a report on this. Basically what happened is in about five minutes, the market fell 5% based on no news or fundamental information or whatever. And then the next five minutes, it sort of recovered. So it was kind of a blip that, you know, um, uh, according to this report at least, came about from uh, some kind of pathological interaction between a large algorithmic trader and, and high frequency traders, right? So this sort of um, uh, raises, in my mind, I think, two classes of important questions, right? One from the perspective of uh, um, you know, the system, from the perspective of policymakers, um, uh, regulators, and so on, is this complex structure that we have, is it good? Do we want things like uh, you know, dark pools? Is it, is it good to have so many exchanges, and so on and so forth? Right? How do we avoid something like this? Right? So those are the, the, the questions at a positive, uh, policy level. But um, uh, even at the level of uh, individual participants, we still have to solve these decision problems, right? The, the, the world is, uh, is, is out there for what it is now. And if I'm trying to uh, um, uh, you know, buy some stock, I have to decide, am I going to use a dark pool? Am I going to use an exchange? How am I going to um, uh, accomplish this? So um, I'm interested in both of these classes of questions. And um, uh, what I'm going to talk to you um, uh, ab about today is two specific problems um, uh, related to high frequency trading and market microstructure. The first is going to be understanding the importance of latency. And the second is going to be understanding the role of dark pools in markets. Right? And so these are two, uh, two different um, uh, research projects I've worked on recently. So let me start out with latency. Um, uh, what do I mean by latency? Um, uh, roughly speaking, I mean um, uh, um, the, the delay between um, uh, um, uh, making a trading decision and its implementation. Right? So if I decide to um, uh, buy 100 shares of Google and I transmit that order to NASDAQ, how long before you know, that um, uh, quantity is, is, is taken from the, uh, the order book? Or similarly, maybe I have an order outstanding and I want to cancel it. How long does it take between when I make that decision and when um, that um, order is pulled from the matching engine and is no longer eligible for a, um, a execution? This sounds like a little bit of an arcane topic, and I think it was, right? It used to be the domain of um, uh, you know, maybe IT people and, and so on and so forth, but really in the past few years, it's entered um, uh, sort of the public's discussion. And even my mom could tell you about latency because we see articles like this, right? So this is an article that um, uh, really sparked a lot of controversy when it came out a few years ago now, it was in the New York Times, um, uh, talking about um, uh, stock traders uh, um, find speed pays in milliseconds. So let's see, at the top talks about uh, you know, um, powerful computers are housed next to the uh, uh, machines that drive marketplaces. That's the idea of co-location we'll come back to. Um, high frequency traders often confound other investors by issuing and canceling simultaneously. So you know, maybe somehow it's good to be able to trade kind of quickly, although you know, bullying doesn't sound um, uh, um, uh, so good. Um, uh, here's a quote from uh, um, uh, someone from the New York Stock Exchange. It's a technological arms race. What separates winners and losers is how fast they can move. Right? So um, uh, clearly a, um, uh, an important discussion um, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and raises a question of is, is this a good thing that we're able to trade so fast, right? Now, one kind of issue is that when you see sort of quotes like this, to a large extent, the, 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 the conversation is dominated by people with an interest, right? So for example, if you happen to be running one of the laggards in uh, terms of technology in uh, um, uh, financial exchanges, maybe you have one view. If you're a high frequency trader, maybe you have another view, right? So you know, uh, I think our role as an academic is to sort of uh, um, uh, dissect this and really to build models to understand what these um, uh, um, uh, you know, phenomena represent. And a question like this, is being able to trade with very low f um, uh, um, latency, with very, very high frequency, is, is, is that good or bad? I'd like to approach that question, but I'm going to ask them an even easier question to start with. Why is latency important, right? Clearly, if people are willing to spend a lot of money to, uh, to, to sort of achieve that, what is it worth, and, uh, and how can we understand that? So that's the question I want to um, uh, answer. I want to um, value the importance of low latency um, and uh, phrase a different way. What is the cost associated with having latency? What is the cost associated with being a slow poke? OK, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, to give you a little bit of a perspective of what the numbers look like, this is the evolution of latency in U.S. equity markets over the, um, the past uh, uh, 35 years. Prior to 1980, it used to be that if you put in an order to buy a stock, it would take two minutes for that to actually occur. Of course, this is the time you know, people make phone calls and stuff. And that sounds ridiculous from our perspective today, but to put that in a little bit of perspective, in you know, that type of era, um, in a typical stock, there was a trade every 20 minutes. So if a trade takes um, uh, you know, two minutes, but you know, there's only one of them every 20 minutes, maybe that's not, uh, that's not so bad. In any event, that's what it was. Um, there was an event in 1980 where they, uh, um, I think they installed a big mainframe, and they were sort of very proud at uh, how the, um, uh, 
um, uh, their, uh, um, their, the processing times came down, and it came down to um, uh, um, uh, about 20 seconds. Of course, if you sort of fast forward to um, uh, um, uh, current times, um, uh, um, you know, 2007, typical kind of uh, latency number is in the hundreds of milliseconds. And um, uh, to give you a sense of what that means, if you ask a human to perform the most basic task, like if I flash a light into your eye and ask you to press a button when you see that, that takes a couple hundred milliseconds, right? Just reaction time, right? So if you're actually making trading decisions on that time scale, it's not uh, um, uh, humans, it's computers trading with each other, right? Um, go forward another couple of years, now you're in the, uh, the single digit millisecond, right? And um, here, um, physics and the speed of light starts to become important. Um, uh, um, delays for propagation of information are significant, right? So if you want to send uh, um, a piece of news from Chicago to, to, to New York, um, uh, um, you know, the speed of light limits you. That can't happen faster than, uh, you know, I don't know what it is, four or five milliseconds, right? So um, uh, if you want to be trading in less than a millisecond, that means you need physical proximity, right? And that's the idea of co-location. So not only are humans out of the game, it's a bunch of computers trading um, with each other, but essentially a bunch of computers in a handful of data centers in New Jersey, right? So, um, uh, and you know, the, the, the trend is to even go below that. So, so state of the art right now is for co-located high frequency trading is, you know, round trip times in the, in the hundreds of uh, microseconds or less, right? Um, uh, so this has been driven by a number of things. One is technology. We can do this. In 1980s, um, you know, they didn't have the computers that were, uh, and the networks that were able to do this. But, but the second thing is there's demand. People are willing to pay for it, right? Part of the, um, the way that all these different exchanges emerged is they offer technology benefits relative to the incumbents, right? So, you know, why might it be important to be able to trade very quickly, right? And, and to whom might it be important? Is it only important to high frequency traders? Should pension funds care? Should retail traders care? Well, some of it depends a little bit on who you are and uh, um, uh, um, uh, what you're doing, but we can come up with a, a, a couple of uh, hypotheses. One is that, you know, typically, you know, um, uh, it, it's best to make uh, decisions with the latest information um, uh, possible, right? So, for example, if you're, uh, um, you know, out there looking to, you know, I don't know, sell a uh, hundred shares of Apple stock, maybe the price that you're willing to sell at depends on a bunch of things, right? It depends on the price other people are, are willing to sell or buy at. It depends on the price on other exchanges. It depends on maybe what Microsoft stock is doing, so on and so forth. So as you digest more recent information, maybe that will um, uh, alter the, um, the, the price you're willing to sell at. And so there would be some advantage to, uh, um, to, to, to having low latency, right? This is really latency in an absolute sense. Another thing you might think about is, well, maybe the absolute latency um, uh, isn't so important, but the relative latency. Right? If you have two traders and they're doing sort of very kind of uh, similar trading strategies, um, typically the flavor of these things is that the, um, the winner takes all. So the fastest guy will get all the profits and the other guy will get knocked out. And uh, so, you know, so there, you know, it's not really important that you trade in under a millisecond, it's just important that you're faster than the next guy. Right? And uh, um, a, a third effect is um, the rules by which exchanges are organized. There's um, uh, um, priority for being early. So there's some advantage of being um, early. Um, you show up at the beginning of, uh, um, uh, at the top of the order book, and that offers certain advantages and so on. So depending on who you are, um, uh, these different effects might kick in. And what I'm going to talk about is a model that really addresses the first one, right? How um, uh, uh, does an um, uh, investor benefit from having access to sort of the latest information um, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, lowering their, uh, th their costs? So here's a model. Right? We have a stylized execution problem. We have a trader who wishes to sell 100 shares over a very short uh, time horizon, let's say um, uh, 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 10 seconds. And this is meant to be a, a problem that uh, um, you know, every trader faces uh, um, at, at one level or another. And as I was describing to er earlier, the, um, the, the value that the trader perceives um, uh, um, uh, evolves over time. And um, the, the, the price the, which the, the, the trader wants to get depends on this value, right? So in order to figure out how best to sell this 100 shares, the trader has to observe this um, uh, um, value process. And if we add a little bit of latency, that introduces a tracking error, right? So now the trader can't, doesn't precisely know what the value is. He only know the value you know, maybe a millisecond ago. And because of that, they ha he has to alter his actions. And that creates a cost. So latency becomes a friction. And what we do is we quantify the, um, the, the, the cost um, uh, um, associated with latency. If I look at this execution problem, I look at the transaction costs in the presence of latency, see how much worse that is than if you had no latency and normalize, right? And what we get is we get a very simple expression, right? The, the particular formula here isn't important. Um, uh, what is important is it depends on uh, um, uh, commonly observed um, uh, uh, market parameters. It depends on the volatility of the stock, right? The more volatile the stock is, the more important latency is. And it depends on the, uh, the bid-ask spread. Right, the more liquid the stock is, the more important latency is. 
And um, instead of looking at the formula, we can look at a picture. Here's what the picture looks like. I took that formula and I calibrated it to s for someone who's trading um, uh, Goldman Sachs on that particular day. And we can see as we go from the um, uh, human time scale of, let's say, 500 milliseconds, really fast human, um, to the machine time scale of a millisecond, what we see that the latency goes from being about 20% um, of uh, um, a transaction cost to being, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, one or two percent. Right. So, does this make sense? Is this significant? Well. Let's try and interpret that. So let's imagine we took the stock and we normalized it so that the bid offer was a penny. Most stocks in the U.S. have a bid offer of a penny, right? Um, what that thing is suggesting, the, the, the plot I showed you, is that the, um, uh, the value of decreasing latency from the human time scale to the machine time scale is about 20% of a penny or 20 mils, right? That seems like a very small number. But do you want to guess how much high-frequency traders make? People who've made the investment to be able to trade on this kind of time scale? Well, nobody really knows, but uh, um, this kind of self-reported numbers are of the same order of magnitude. Right? A high-frequency trader, you know, again, based on these sources, might typically um, expect to make in the tens of mils per share traded. Right? Very, very, very kind of uh, small margin, same order of magnitude. Similarly, let's say um, you didn't have the, um, the ability to, uh, to trade uh, uh, electronically and you wanted to farm it out. You wanted to pay an investment bank to trade for you, and presumably they've made that investment. Right? How much would they charge you? They charge you a similar kind of number, right? So typical um, uh, fee for um, uh, algorithmic uh, um, uh, trading execution would be on the order of, uh, um, uh, uh, on the, of the same order of magnitude, right? And it's of the s same scale of, uh, um, of the cost. So this tells us a couple of things, right? Number one, um, latency is potentially important to all investors, right? So I wasn't, you know, this, the, the basic problem I started with, the problem of shelling 100 shares in, in, in 10 seconds, everybody has that problem. Retail guy might have that problem. If you're um, you know, uh, really trying to sell a million shares, well, you know, at some kind of fine time scale, that breaks down into individual trades of 100 shares. So it's important to everyone, right? But how important it is depends on what the rest of your costs are. If you're the most, um, uh, at the most efficient um, uh, cost level in terms of the commissions you've negotiated and so on and so forth, um, latency is worth about as much. On the other hand, if you're a retail investor, you're not paying five mils per share traded, you're paying $10 to E-Trade. That's orders of magnitude more than any of this, right? So um, from my perspective, for, um, for a retail investor, this kind of stuff doesn't matter. And the commissions and other things you're paying way dominate the, um, the, the, the value of, uh, of, of, of latency. Okay, so some cross-sectional stuff, but I won't uh, um, uh, um, uh, talk about that. Um, the second topic I want to um, briefly mention here is um, uh, dark pools. Um, dark pools are an alternative trading mechanism, and the name sounds kind of uh, foreboding, but the basic idea is, uh, is, is simple. If we think about something like a limit order book, right, um, if I want to buy, um, typically there is an offered price which is higher than the price at which um, uh, I could sell, which is the bid price, right? So there's a bid offer spread, and in, you know, again, something like a limit order book or an exchange, someone is providing liquidity, right, maybe a high frequency trader, um, and, you know, they're going to charge for that, and this bid offer spread is what they charge. Right? Now, um, what's an alternative mechanism? The idea of a dark pool is instead of having you know, these intermediaries um, uh, um, uh, posting orders, let's let people directly trade with each other. So let's just have an anonymous um, uh, um, uh, pool where people will, you know, some people can declare they want to buy, some people can declare they want to sell, and if there is a match, they'll be matched with each other and it will occur at mid-market, so no transaction costs. Right? So that sort of sounds good on, uh, um, uh, on paper, but the, but the key is you're giving up something. Right? If you try and buy an, on an exchange with a market order, you're going to execute for sure. Right? If you put an order into a dark pool, you'll get it at a better price, but you may or may not get it. Right? And this is actually, I think, a trade-off that occurs in many markets. Right? A trade-off between uh, um, uncertain trade at a better price, i.e. the dark pool, or guaranteed trade at a, um, uh, a worse price. Right? So for example, an eBay. Right? In an eBay auction, you typically buy it all. You can pay a, a, a price premium, get the, um, the item you want with certainty, or you can participate in the auction. Maybe you'll get it for cheaper, maybe you won't get it. Um, online advertising, the way um, uh, display ads work or um, uh, so on, there's a couple of different pricing models. Right? Um, a publisher can charge an uh, um, uh, advertiser based on just showing the impression, based on you know, only if people click on the expression, maybe based only if there's a transaction. Right, so here you have different degrees of certainty, but of course, if the, you know, you're going to charge by transaction, you're going to charge way, way more than if you charge um, uh, just by a uh, um, uh, click. And we can see financial examples here. What I'm going to talk about here is a, um, a simple stylized model 
um, uh, in a financial context where um, investors have two options. One is what I'll call a guaranteed market where um, uh, you can trade with certainty, but you pay a transaction cost. You pay the bid offer spread. Right? And so here I'm thinking of something like a dealer market or electronic limit order book or, or, or something like that. And the second option is a, um, a dark pool. Here you put your order into one of these electronic crossing networks. Um, uh, if trade occurs, it occurs at mid-market. There's zero transaction cost, but you're not sure it's going to happen. Right? So we're trying to evaluate um, uh, these two alternatives. We have a model, and the, the, the key ingredient in this model is um, uh, information ladders a lot. And this is, uh, um, uh, um, ties in a little bit with what the, um, uh, um, uh, Ray was uh, talking about. In industry parlance, this is uh, short-term alpha. And what I mean by information is, do you have any information about what's going to happen to the price over the short term, over the time horizon of your trade being executed? Right? This might be important for, um, for, for two reasons. Number one, if I think the stock is going up, Right? And let's say, in fact, I'm pretty sure that the stock is going up. That's going to affect whether you know, um, I want to trade with certainty or I want to be uncertain. Right? For exa and in, in particular, if I'm certain, maybe I'm willing to pay the transaction costs and I want to trade with certainty. So my information clearly matters. Right? However, other people's information matters also. Right? Why? Because um, uh, um, when you trade, you're trading with uh, um, others in the, in, the, in the case of a dark pool. And if you're systematically trading with people who have more information than you, maybe that's not going to work out for you so well in the end. Right? So one critical thing is going to be modeling information. We're going to have a model where we have um, uh, three kinds of traders. We have speculators. Right? Everybody observes some kind of uh, a signal about what's going to happen to the price. The speculators, they're just trying to, um, to, to make money uh, um, uh, off the price swings. Right? On the other hand, we have um, intrinsic um, uh, um, buyers and sellers. They also would like to buy low and sell high. However, they, they have their own reasons to trade as well. They have idiosyncratic um, uh, kind of desire to trade. Maybe you're a pension fund and you're rebalancing your portfolio. So, you know, I don't know, you want to buy that Google stock cheap. But, you know, even if you have to pay a little bit more for it, you're still willing to buy it because you, uh, you, know, you get utility from, uh, from, from, from having it. We solve for an equilibrium in this model and we get a number of interesting predictions. So, number one, who chooses which marketplace? Well, as you might expect, the more information you have, the more you're going to go to the guaranteed marketplace. If you're very well informed and you know the price is going to go up, you want to buy with certainty. On the other hand, if you're less informed, if you have little or no information, maybe you're only tra um, trading for, uh, for idiosyncratic reasons, well, you know, you're willing to trade in the dark pool. You're willing to take that risk because it doesn't make sense for you to pay transaction costs. Right? Now, um, that sounds reasonable, but that has a couple of implications. One is if we imagine the world with the dark pool and the world without the dark pool, transaction costs will be higher in the presence of the dark pool. Why is that? Where do these transaction costs coming from? These are, these are bid offer spread is going to be set by market makers who um, uh, are, are trying to make money. If you have the, um, a dark pool present and it is systematically um, uh, sorting the, um, the traders, right? And so only informed traders go and trade in the guaranteed market. Well, those market makers are going to end up systematically losing more money. And so what are they going to do? They're going to widen spreads right, in order to compensate for that. Right? So the presence of the dark pool is actually going to deteriorate the quality of the, um, the, the, the guaranteed market. Investors in the dark pool are going to experience adverse selection. What do I mean by that? If you trade in the guaranteed market, you know, no matter whether the price is going to go up or down, you're going to get that share. Right? If you trade in the dark pool, you know, you're not sure um, uh, if you will or not. But if you're trying to buy, what will happen is typically when the market is going down, your order will get filled. And when the market is going up, it won't. So precisely in the circumstances where you don't want to trade because you could have bought it cheap later, you will trade and otherwise you won't. This is something that um, uh, I think is very crucial that people don't understand in practice, or a surprising number of people. Right? So uh, a naive person will look at dark pools and say there's no transaction fees. You're trading at mid-market. Well, because you're not trading for sure, and because your trades are going to be correlated with what happens to the price afterwards, you are, in fact, paying a type of adverse selection fee. It's just implicit. It's not explicit like the bid offer spread. You see the bid offer spread. It's you know, clear what you're paying. Here, statistically, you're paying this fee, but it's very real, and it can be of the same order of magnitude as the bid offer spread. Right? So the dark pool isn't as good as it looks. And finally, um, uh, maybe what's uh, um, uh, most interesting in my mind, overall, introducing the dark pool um, uh, decreases welfare. Right. So what do I mean by that? Let's um, uh, try and think about whether um, uh, this is sort of good or not. We have a bunch of shares um, uh, um, floating around and a bunch of money. If I think of transfers of money from people and different traders in the system, that sort of doesn't matter. That's zero sum. If I buy the stock um, uh, from you and I pay a um, uh, um, you know, dollar less, you know, maybe I gain a dollar, but maybe you lose a dollar. From the perspective of you know, the system, it doesn't matter. Right? On the other hand, the shares do matter. 
right? Why? Because people have different intrinsic value for those, right? There's, there's, there's people who have a, a lot of value to owning them and, 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 and people who don't, right? So what you'd ideally like is you'd like these intrinsic sellers to be selling to um, uh, the, these intrinsic buyers in order to maximize the utility in the system, and that's the concept of the, this, this uh, um, social welfare, right? Well, it turns out the presence of the dark pool um, impedes that and um, uh, reduces the welfare of the system. So I'm over time, so I'll, uh, I'll stop here.